Okay, so we're going to finish locking uh, the basis and dimension. So we were here. Okay, here with theorem. If V is an n dimensional vector space and S is a subset of V, and v is an n-dimensional vector space, so typically this example would be r to the n or p n minus 1 x, right? So polynomials of degree n minus 1 or less. And s is a subset of v that contains k, where k is greater than n elements, then s is linearly dependent. Okay, so s has got uh, v, v1, v2, all the way to vn, but then it's got more things after that until you end up at vk, because k is greater than n. Okay. Then s is, oh, sorry. Then s is linearly dependent. Okay, so a set, that's bigger than, a set that's bigger than dimension is always dependent. Equivalently, if T is a linearly independent subset of an n-dimensional vector space V, then T contains J, which is less than N elements. Okay, so any subset that, is, any subset that is bigger than the dimension of the vector space is dependent. Any set, any set, whereas any set that is independent is smaller than the dimension of the subspace smaller than the dimension of the vector space, okay, or, or equal to, smaller than or equal to, okay. So there's, that's what it says, there's two, there's two things it doesn't say though, it doesn't say, it doesn't say that if S is linearly dependent, it automatically is bigger, has more elements than the dimension, it doesn't say that, right? It says that if it's bigger, it has more elements than the, than the dimension, then it's dependent. But it doesn't, to be dependent, it doesn't have to have more elements than, than the dimension. That's obvious, right? For example, it could be the set containing just a zero vector, which is automatically dependent. Or it could be a set with just two vectors, which are scalar multiples of each other. Then it also doesn't say, it doesn't say, it, then it does, then it says that, that every independent subset has no more than n elements. It says that but it doesn't say that every subset that has no more than n elements is, in, is independent. Again, that's obvious, right? You would have a set with n elements in it, but some of the elements are scalar multiples of each other, or linear, linear combinations of each other, or one of the elements is zero, and that set would be dependent. Okay. So maybe I could summarize this by saying, so in this context, the dimension of V is n, right? Dimension of V is n. And then we have, now, if S, which is a subset of V, has more elements than the dimension of N, so let's just write like that. If the size of the number of elements in S is bigger than the dimension of V, then S is linearly dependent, whereas if we write this way as if T is linearly independent, then the size of T is less than or equal to the dimension of V. So let me just write that now. Okay, so it's saying those two things, but it's not putting an arrow, oh, sorry, but there's no arrow in that direction, there's no arrow in that direction, just in those directions I've written down, right? Okay, that's what this theorem is saying. Okay. Now we have a proof, really. And when we've done that proof, we'll be done with this. We'll be done with this chapter, in fact. Okay. Okay. Let V be an n-dimensional vector space. Okay. Consider a basis for V. For example, a basis will have to have n elements. We've proved that previously. Let now let T be a linearly independent subset of V. Oh, so we're doing the second part first. We're showing that if T contains, if T is independent, then it contains no more than n element, no more than n elements, no more than n vectors. Let T be a linearly independent subset of V with J elements. 
We're not saying anything about j yet, but we're going to try and show that j is less than or equal to n. So first of all, we make a new set. Okay, the set b tilde one, b with a funny thing on it, one is well, it's it's got t one in it, and then it's got b one, b two. So it's got it's got the first thing in from t, the first vector from t, and then it's got all of the vectors in in, in b naught, all of the vectors in the basis. So it's going to have n plus one elements. I can say that for sure. So that the size of b one is n plus one, right? Okay. Whereas the size of t was j and the size of b naught was n. Okay. Since b naught was a basis for v, we can express t1 as a linear combination of the vectors in b naught. Right, okay, of course, because b naught generates v because it's a basis. So t1 is a linear combination of vectors of vectors b1 to bn. Okay. Where and oh, and not all the coefficients alpha i can be equal to zero. Okay. Well, because if they were all equal to zero, then t1 would be the zero vector. But if t1 was a zero vector, then t would be a dependent, a dependent, a linearly dependent set, because any set with a zero vector is dependent. And we said that t was independent. Okay, so not all the alpha i is equal to zero. Okay, so one of them, let's call it alpha p, is non-zero. Okay, so then we can rearrange and then divide through by that probably, yes. So you bring, what, you, you rearrange by saying, well, you take the, the one with coefficient that's not zero to that side, then you have the sum, but you've got to leave the p out of the sum. Okay, so by, now by this I mean I'll put underlines there, so it's a vector. This this sum now is the sum from from i equals one to n, where i is not equal to p. Okay, then we have we still have. Wait, I took the oh now I need to, I need to bring the the t one of it to this side. Okay, of course. Okay, I mean th this is just straightforward from that. Just a rearrangement of that. Now, if the alpha p is not zero, I can now divide through by a minus alpha p because it's not zero. And so then I'm going to get, oh, sorry. Then I'm going to get b p equals, so divide all of these terms in this sum by minus alpha p. So then I'll get alpha i over minus alpha p times by the vector b i and divide minus t1 by minus alpha p, of course, then you'll get plus. I don't want to put t1 over alpha. That looks like you're dividing a vector. You don't really divide vectors. You multiply vectors by scalars. Sometimes the scalars are themselves reciprocals of real numbers, but you know, don't divide vectors, just multiply vectors. Okay, uh, so multiply by 1 over alpha p, t1. Okay, and that's exactly what they've got, right? Okay. All right, so since... Since this BP is a linear combination, like this, of, of BP is a linear combination of all the other vectors in the set B1, we can, B tilde 1, we can drop BP from the set to create a new set. Okay, so now we have T1 and B1. We just leave, we just B1 is exactly the same as, as this B1 tilde, but with um, out the BP. Now, this set is a basis for V, since it's linearly independent, and it still spans V. Well, okay, it still spans V. Spans is another word for generates. It still, so it still generates V because, oh, because this, you know, the, what we're saying is that the set generated by B1 is equal to the set generated by till B1 because even though we removed BP in going from B1 tilde to B1, it, didn't, it doesn't affect the span because BP is actually itself just a linear combination of the other vectors. So that vector is still, this BP is still in the span of, of B, still in this, BP is this, vector BP is still in this span, so we don't affect the span. And, and we said originally that 
the span or the set generated by B1 tilde was V, right? No, we said that this B1 tilde we introduced, right? It was the, the basis B0 with an extra vector added. So of course, since the, the basis generated the whole thing, so we could say something like this actually, that this set B1 tilde, what it generates is certainly at least what the what the set what the set B naught generates because the set B naught is contained in B one right so certainly that's true but the B one just generates the whole of V right so that means that that's that this subset sign actually is an equality sign because you can't generate more than the vec the, the vec space that you're in because the vector space is closed under linear combinations, so you can't go outside the vector space by taking linear combinations. So, yeah, so this all proves that, this all proves um, this thing, that this set B1 still spans V, okay? Now, is this set linearly independent? How do we know this set is linearly independent? Okay, so certainly this set, this beat that B naught that was chosen to be independent. T was also chosen to be independent. Okay, so now, but now you gotta be careful. You can't just like say, oh, B naught is in. You can't just say something like this. You can't say T is independent, so all the vectors in it are independent. So therefore, I can if I add them to that, you get something that's independent. That's not how an independence works, right? If you have two independent sets, you can easily combine them and get a set that's not independent. So now we have this vector t, and we have this t1. We add it to b0. How we add it to b0 to take away bp. How do we know that what we get is independent? Well, so t is independent, b0 is independent. T1 is a linear combination of the vectors. T1 is a linear combination of the vectors and B0. Hmm. I'm not feeling this because look, couldn't we, we chose this basis B0 for V. When we chose T to be a linearly independent subset of V, there was, no, there was nothing stopping us, there was nothing stopping us saying that maybe T was, you know, it was T had consisted of B1 itself and then B2, and then maybe some other things. And nothing, nothing stopping that being the case, right? And then, hmm. I don't know. Okay, let's try and, let's just try and prove that this set B1 is independent, okay? So we're trying to prove that the set B1 is independent. So to prove that, you've got to take a linear combination of the things from B1 and set it equal to zero, right? So let's take a linear combination of the things from B1. So let's call it, let's start with, let's just have a, maybe we'll call it, um, beta one times T, no, let's have, this is called a beta, times t1 plus beta 1 times b1. So the beta 1 has no relation to the beta. All the way to beta p minus 1 of b p of b oh, of b yeah, you know what? Actually, let's write it like this. Beta 1 times b1 plus all the other up until you get beta p minus 1 of b P minus one. Then let's put in stick in the, the t, beta, beta p times t one, and then let's have beta p plus one of b p plus one all the way till you get beta n of b n. Okay, so those are the vectors there. I'm underlining them. So the vectors, and then we have the scalars. Okay, so that's a linear combination, and we're saying that linear combination is equal to zero. 
Okay, now, to, if, we, if this set is B1 is going to be linearly independent, we're going to be able to prove that all those scalars are zero, right? Okay. And somehow to do this, we probably want to use the fact that B0 was independent and maybe maybe the T, maybe also the T was independent. Okay. So, Ah, wait a second. T1 is itself any combination of the vectors in B0. Does that help? That does not help. No. Hmm, wait a second. T1 was a linear combination. T1 was a linear combination of the vectors in B in, in B. And the coefficient in front of the BP was not zero, so it's that that somehow makes T1 independent of all these other vectors. Yes, okay. So, T1 is this linear combination, okay, where alpha P, where alpha P is not equal to zero. Okay. Now, somehow this must mean that T1 is not a linear combination of without having the beta, you need the BP. The without, without that, you can't have it as a linear combination. Mm. So I know that's the case because I know that every vector can be expressed in a unique way uh, as a linear combination of things from a basis. But we haven't actually, I don't think we've seen that, a theorem like that yet, have we? I mean, I'm not sure why, that seems like an important theorem. Okay, yeah, I... Okay. Right now, I don't see any way to do this, to, to, to proceed with this proof, without assuming that, and I'd like to assume that, I'd like to have that because it's, I think it's an important theorem, but there might be another way. Okay, all right, so let me do this. Let me put a new, let me have a new theorem, right? This new theorem says, it says if B is a basis, for V, then every vector in V is a unique linear combination, then every vector in V is a unique linear combination of vectors from B. So to me, actually, this is this should be the definition of a the definition of a basis. That a basis is this set, this subset of a vector space, which allows you to express every vector in the set, but only in one unique way. Okay. To me, that should be the definition of a basis, and then from there you you then you say what it means to be linearly independent or dependent, and what it means to generate. Okay. However, that's not how we're doing this. That's how that's not how it's been done in this book. But I do think that this theorem might be necessary for for this this uh, proof that we're trying to do now. So, so we have this theorem. Okay, I will prove it later. I will prove it after this. Now let's use this theorem to prove this thing about this thing about the size of linearly independent sets. Whatever this thing we're doing, right? This thing. Okay. Where were we? So, okay, so we had got to, we were trying to deal with how, how do we know that, v, that this set B1 is linearly independent, okay, well, here's how we know. 
T1 is a unique linear combination. Uh, oops, sorry. T1 is a unique linear combination of the vectors of B0. This, this, the coefficient in front of the BP is not zero. Okay. The coefficient in front of the the coefficient in front of the, the BP is not zero. So that means that T1 cannot be written as a linear combination of these remaining vectors, because if it could be written as a linear combination of B of these remaining vectors without the BP, then we would have two different ways of writing T1 as a linear combination of vectors from B0. And this this theorem that we've assumed, I'm going to prove later, says that no, there's only unique, there's a unique way of writing a vector as a linear combination of basis vectors. Okay, so they said B1 is linearly independent. And we proved, much easier was proving that it spans, that it still generates V. Okay, now add T2 to form the set B tilt 2. So take this T2, add it to, let's, do, actually, let's actually write down what that does. So B2 tilde will have, it'll have T1, it'll have T2, and then it'll have B, B1, or B2 all the way to BP minus 1, and then B, P plus 1, and then all the way to B, N. So it's going to have um, M plus 1 and M plus N. Okay? But now we added T2, and then we do the same thing we did, we did here, where we express T2 as an linear combination of the elements of B1, which we can do because B1 is a basis, and then there's a unique way of doing that, and we drop one, we drop the, the one of the elements which has BQ, say, which has a non-zero scalar, just like we did above, and thus we get a new basis, B2, right? Which B2 is contained in B tilde 2, but it doesn't have the BQ, right? Where BQ is something, you know, the, the BQ, Q is not equal to P, by the way, B, BQ is uh, one of these vectors that was in, one of these B vectors that was still in B2 tilde. Okay? And we carry on doing this, and eventually we have added all the elements in T to our new basis. Okay? You just carry on doing that. Okay? Note that we will be never forced to pull out one of the elements that we previously added. Oh, right. Okay, so what they're saying is that you, you, you'll never have to, you'll, have, you'll express T1 as a linear combination of, you'll express, so you express T1, sorry, you expressed T1 as a linear combination of the other vectors. Then you're going to, why will we never be forced to put out one of the elements that we previously added? So, sorry, you, so you have T, so, Let's actually do this second step in more detail. Okay. Ugh, oh, sorry. Okay. I'm trying to, so now I'm trying to understand this remark. We will never be forced to pull out one of the elements that we previously added. Okay. So, we have B1. We add T2 to get B2 tilde. Okay. I need a bit more space, I think. We have B2. We add T T2 to get B2 to, to get B2 tilde. So now we have T1, T2, B1 all the way to B P minus one, and then B P plus one. So we don't have B P then all the way to Bn, okay? Now, we express T2 as a linear combination of, of what? Well, you can certainly express T2 as a linear combination of the elements of B1, right? Because B1 is still a basis, right? This, this, uh, this B1 is still a basis. So T2 is certainly, T2 is certainly equal to 
um, let's call it the, yeah, let's call it let's use alphas again because we used alphas above. So something equal to alpha let's write it looks like so something equal to alpha one b one plus ah, let's do it like this. It's equal to this sum. Where p is not equal to oh sorry where i is not equal to p okay we're skipping the p um, of alpha i b i okay that's sum um, um, but also we need the it might, it might also involve the T1, right? Because it's the set which contains the set which contains B1, this whole set which contains all of these, and T1. That's the, that's the basis that we're working with now. So we also have, I'll call, it, I'll call it alpha P, because we haven't used alpha P in that list yet. Alpha P, um, T1, okay. So that's certainly true, because... Be, that's true because it's B... Because B2 is a basis. Okay. Now, one of those scalars is non-zero because T2 is not zero. Okay. Now, in fact, one of the scalars other than AP, alpha P, is not zero. Why? Because if all the scalars except for alpha P were zero, we would have T2 equals alpha P times T1. So T2 would be a linear, com would be, T2 would be a linear combination of T1, a scalar multiple of T1. So that means that would say that T2 is a, T2 and T1 are dependent, T2 is de linear dependent on T1, and that's not the case because we assume this set T to be independent. Okay, so one of the scalars other than alpha P, in this case, is not zero. So that, that, that scalar, so the alpha, oops, so, you know, so there's some alpha Q where Q is not equal to P that is not zero in that linear combination. That's, and then it's the, it's the, it's the BP, it's, sorry, it's the BQ we pull out, right, because of that. So we never have to, put, we don't have to pull out this T1. Now, if you do the next thing, if you do the same thing with T3, you'll have like T3 is a linear combination of, now I is not equal to P or Q, there's alpha I, B, I, plus, and now you'll have alpha, I'm going to call it P, alpha P, T1, plus alpha Q, T2, that, that your new basis will have T1, T2, and all the Bs apart from, all the Bi's apart from B, P, and B, Q, but now, you must have a non-zero alpha other than the alpha P and the alpha Q because otherwise T3 would be a linear combination of T1 and T2, yes. So in this way, we're never forced to pull out one of the elements we previously added. We're never forced to pull out a T. We're always able to pull out a B. Okay. Now it says, since we can add all the elements of T without running out of original elements of B to remove, it must be the case that J is less than or equal to N. Mm. Okay. I don't find that very satisfying at the moment. Okay, since we can add all elements of T without running, without running out of original elements of B to remove, it must be the case that J is less than or equal to N. How do we know that we can add, how do we know that we don't run out of elements of B to remove? Okay, because everything in T is a linear combination. Everything in T is in the vector space. Oh, I see, okay. Everything, everything in T is, everything in T is in the vector space. So at each stage, when we make B1, B2, B3, those are all basises. So T, each of these Ts, it's always a linear combination of elements from that basis. And this argument here, this argument here, shows that you never, that you always get to remove a B, you never have to remove a T, okay? 
because if you did have to remove a T, I mean, how do we know that this sum I find this very unsatisfying. Uh, it feels to me like I mean, it feels to me like not running out of elements of B to remove is kind of like assumed in what we're doing here it's that it's not really a consequence of, of this. Okay. I suppose, let's say, suppose you did run out of elements of B to remove. So you came to you came to a T, where well you'd added the you added the T, right? So you had you had like B, um, and we do it's like we had B one, you had B B two, B three, and now let's say you got to B K, right? And you'd, you now, you'd added like a bunch of the t's then. You'd added all the way up to tk, right? Yes, you'd added all the way up to tk, okay. And you still had some, suppose you still had some b's, okay. So you still had some, um, some b's left. I don't know which b's you have left. Let's say you have bi left. Yeah, B J. Oh, let's say, sorry. You have. Suppose you have. Uh, yeah, you have. You have some B's left. Okay, B I. B J. Whatever. Okay. Now, when you express T K at this stage, oh, you, 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 now you make the sets. Ah, no, I should rather not, rather looking at BK, I should look rather at B tilde K, okay? This is the set from which we're going to remove something. So here you have T1 all the way to TK. And then you also have... You have a bunch of Bs, okay? Never mind for now how many Bs you have. You have some Bs, okay? I mean, never mind which ones they are. Okay, so you have those Bs, you have those Ts. Okay, now, what you do now, the next step is always to express the last T you added, Tk, as a linear combination of all the other vectors in the set, which you can do because, because you, you will have known that Bk minus 1, which is T1 to Tk minus 1, with the same, with the same Bs, that's the basis. Okay, so you express the, the you express the T K as a linear combination of the other vectors in in B K, okay, because of this. Okay. Then you drop one of the scale one of the you drop one of the one of the one of the coefficients is not zero, and this argument down here shows that this argument over here, we don't throw over here, shows that the coefficient, the coefficient that's not zero, well, that one of the coefficients that's not zero is in front of a b, not, it's not, all, right? The coefficients of all the b's are not all zero, so you can drop that and you can take out a b. Okay, that's fine. Now suppose you get to a stage where you only have, you have all the, you have added some t, you've added all the tk's, Okay, you've added, t, you've added it up to TK, which is, and you have still some more T's to add, but you just have one B left. Let's just assume that it's B1 you have left. It doesn't make a difference what number it is. Suppose you have B1 that's left. Okay. Now, you know that you can express T, you express, so you express TK as a linear combination of the other vectors in that set, B tilde K, and then you drop you drop a coefficient. You, so you, you find the coefficient that's not zero. Well, there's only one. It must be in front of the B1, 
because otherwise, if it wasn't in front of the B1, then TK would be a linear combination of the other Ts, and it's not because T is a linear independent set. So that means you can drop the B1. Okay, so you can drop the B1. And you go to T1 to TK. So you drop the B1, right? Oh, so move, in moving to BK plus 1, is that what we call it? What do you want to call it? Moving to two B two. No, in moving to BK, right? Of course, yes, we drop. We, it's the B one that we drop, and so now we only have Ks left. We only have Ts left. Sorry. So this argument shows that we would run out of Bs before we run out of Ts, because we can we can never remove we can never remove this procedure only removes Bs, it never removes Ts. Okay, now, however, if this procedure is going to, every time you add a T, it's going to remove a B, okay? And it can never, ever remove Ts, it only removes Bs, okay? So if every time you add a T, it removes a B, and it can carry on it, at removing all the Bs, then there must be more Ts than Bs, or at least as many Ts as Bs. So it must be, yes, it must be that... No, sorry. If this procedure, every time you add a T, you're able to remove a B, right? So there must always be a B to remove in this procedure. So we we verified this, this, this procedure each that this procedure each step, each time you do a step, you can you can do the next step, you can add a T and remove a B. But if every time you add a T, you, you remove a B, there must be a, for every T you add, there must be a B there to be removed. So there must be at least as many Bs as there are Ts. So the number of Bs, N, must be greater than or equal to the number of Ts, J. So J must be less than or equal to N. Yes. Okay. That's cool. Okay. So... So I, at the moment, I do not like this proof. I would probably try and find a different proof if it was important to me. And I also figured out, well, I also think I figured out that this proof requires, has something missing from it, and what's missing from it is this theorem, that if B is a basis of V and every vector is a unique linear combination of vectors from B. Furthermore, I think this theorem, well, I think this theorem is important. It's very important in its own right, and so I want to prove it for its own sake. So in the next video, I'm going to prove that theorem. And, however, I'm especially interested to hear if you can figure out how this proof can work without this theorem, like the book, like this set of notes seems to imply. Furthermore, I'm very interested to know nicer proofs of this thing. Oh, shit, wait a second. I haven't, we haven't, I've, I've, we've, we've gone through the proof, we've got, we're happy that J is less than equal to N. How does that prove this, this, these two things here? Okay, so the two things are that, the two things are that if S, if the, if the dimension of S is bigger than the dimension of V, then S is linearly dependent. And if, if the size of, sorry, if the size of S, the number of elements in S is bigger than the dimension of V, then S is linearly dependent. And if the number of elements in T is less than or equal to the dimension of V, then T is linearly independent. Okay, but these two things are very related to each other. So all, all we've actually, directly, all, it seems like all we've proved is this one, right, about the number of things in T being less than or equal to the, num the dimension of V if T is linearly independent. But notice this, okay, and this is a really important thing, I think. Really important technique, right? <laughs> if you have, if you have, Actually, you know what? It's so important that I think I'll make another video on it. The point is that one of these things, these things are contrapositives, contrapositives, converses, I can't remember, it doesn't matter. These things, these two things are logically equivalent because, um, so, so it's a bit irritating that actually that it talks about S, oh, that it talks about S and T, and of course, in different names, 
really we're talking about, suppose you have a subset, okay, let's call it T. You have a subset T, okay. Uh, yeah, so you have a subset of the vector space T. Now, if T is linearly, we've just shown that if T is linearly independent, then the size of T, the dimension of T, the size of T, the number of elements in T is less than the dimension of V, less than or equal to the dimension of V, right? Okay. Now, suppose that instead that the size, the number of things in T is bigger than the dimension of V, right? Okay. But T, size of T greater than dimension of V, that's the same thing as, as saying it's not the case. This statement is equivalent to saying it's not the case that T is less than or equal to the dimension of V, right? Another way of writing that is T is not less than or equal to the dimension of V, okay? Because greater than and not less than or equal to, those are the same thing, okay? So if we have, if we have this, we do not have this, right? Now, if we do not have this, then we cannot have this. We cannot have T being linearly independent. Because if we had T being linearly independent, we would have the size of T being less than or equal to the dimension of V. So if we have, if we don't have this, if this is not true, then this can't be true. Okay. So if, if the size of T is greater than the dimension of V, then T cannot be linearly independent, right? Okay. T cannot be linearly independent. It's not the case that T is linearly independent. But what does not, what does not linearly independent mean? It means the same thing as linearly dependent. Linearly dependent and linearly dependent are opposites to each other. So in other words, if the size of T is bigger than the dimension of V, then T is linearly dependent. So the, the thing is, basically, that this statement is the negation of that statement, and this statement is the negation of that statement. So this is a, the pattern basically is we had, we proved alpha implies B, okay, sorry, we proved A implies B, okay, but that's actually the same thing as saying that not B implies not A, okay. Yes, if you prove A implies B, then it's the same as playing not A, not B implies not A. Now for me, I'll make another video going more into more, into more depth about this logical equivalence, okay, or, and how I personally understand it. And I'm also need to make another video where I prove this theorem, okay.